It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Cynthia Barnhart, who is the Chancellor of MIT for this Jones Seminar. Uh, Chancellor Barnhart previously served as both Associate and Acting Dean for the School of Engineering and uh, Operations Research Center, as well as Center for Transportation and Logistics. And her research focuses on building mathematical programming models and large-scale optimization approaches, some of the things that she's going to talk about today uh, for transportation logistics. And she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Ac Academy of Arts and Sciences, and has served as the president of the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences, which is the main community in this area, as well as uh, several editorial roles for the flagship journals in her discipline. And the one thing that's not written here is that she's my former PhD advisor. So with that information, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Cindy to this talk. Thanks so much, Vikrant. Uh, can you hear me OK, everyone? So what Vikrant didn't say, of course, is that um, it's because of students like Vikrant that uh, he could say all those great things about me. Um, so it's been such a pleasure being able to work with Vikrant and, and the many other students I've worked with. So today, um, Vikrant gave me some information. He said that many of you maybe are not uh, haven't had much of an exposure to operations research, and so I should try to give you a sense of what it is before I dive into a, how we use it in, in airline optimization and more generally in aviation optimization. So I apologize to those of you who this will seem obvious. And I hope that those of you who don't know too much about OR, it will be enough to give you a sense. OK. so. Uh, I also will say, please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions. I think it's always more fun to have a dialogue and a discussion um, and not just have me up here talking away. So what I will do today is first try to introduce in literally a few slides um, an overview of operations research, at least related to um, some of the work that we're doing. And then I'll talk about the focus of much of our work, which is in the airline and aviation worlds. And I'll talk about how we work on optimizing airline transportation using oper operations research. And I have a little example um, on crew scheduling that I hope will illustrate what we do. Uh, and then I thought I'd get a little more philosophical and talk about how I think about the work that's been done in airline optimization in kind of the first phase of the focus of researchers and then how that changed in moving to the second phase. And then talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in aviation or airline operations research. Uh, and this part of the talk is meant to give you a sense of um, maybe some more insight into the world of air travel and how operations research plays a role without giving you very many details of the technical parts of how we do it. But more, here are the challenges, and here are co some of the um, contributions that have been made in addressing those challenges. OK. So you know, all definitions of things have their flaws. But I thought I would just start by trying to give you a sense of what operations research is. Um, and it's about um, mathematical processes that involve data. We call them mathematical models that are, tend to be linear programs or integer programs or nonlinear programs, and computation, so algorithms. And the idea is you put all that to work to solve really difficult, typically very large scale problems that as a human, it's really hard for you to be able to just kind of, uh, without the help of these kinds of mathematical and computing tools, it's very hard for you to figure out what to do to solve the problem. Okay, okay so this first slide is dated, but I thought it would give you a sense of how our field has progressed. 
So in the first line, there was a, a paper by uh, a group led by Bob Bixby, and they were looking at, in the time period from 88 to 2004, algorithmic advances. So forget computing, just what have we done in the underlying sort of uh, development of mathematical approaches and algorithms to uh, how has it affected the solvability of our problems? And so there's a, a set of test problems that they used. And they said in that period of time, through algorithmic advances, the speed up was 3,300 times faster to solve those problems. Meanwhile, on the computing side, there are lots of advances there. And there, the speed up was 1,600 times faster. So because what we do in OR is we bring together computing and algorithms, when they combine the effects of both, they found that um, you could solve from 88, which by the way was when I finished my PhD and started using these methods on these kinds of problems. Um, from 88 to 2004, there was a speed up of 5,300,000 times. So what that means is something that took two months of computation time to solve became about a second. But it actually doesn't even mean that because the, you couldn't um, fit the problem into the computer and have it turn away for two months. So when I first started working in this field, one of the things I learned kind of quickly was, well, all right, this, this algorithm isn't exactly working now on this problem that we're trying to solve for American Airlines, but let's just wait a few months because the, the speed ups were happening so fast that, that We'll try again then and see what happens. So this kind of advancement, I don't know how it measures now, but certainly the speed ups have been continuing at a nonlinear rate. Okay, and that's a good thing. And why is that a good thing? It's because the US aviation system is a really large scale, complicated problem. And if we're trying to make decisions about how to design it and how to operate it, we need to have a lot of power um, behind our computing and our algorithmic approaches. So this is just a, a simulation of uh, actual flight schedules um, from the US aviation system. And I don't know if I can. Uh, OK, so let me, let me just see if I restart it, what happens. Oh, it's just kind of stuck there doing nothing for some reason. But it, I, I like watching it because it's really interesting that you see the red eyes coming across the country, and then what you see is as the sun rises, the flights start taking off across the US. So this system has um, 42,000 flights about per day, um, 2.5 million passengers per day, um, 29 million square miles of airspace with 5,000 aircraft in the sky at any time and 520 or so air traffic control towers. How has operations research been used? It's been used to do a bunch of things. It's been used to design the flight schedules of airlines, where to fly, when to fly, what kind of aircraft to fly. Um, it's been used to design the aircraft assignments um, to different flight legs in the schedules, the crews to flight legs, making pricing and re revenue management decisions, figuring out when something gets messed up, which it always does, how to recover operations, and the list goes on and on and on. Okay. So what I thought I would do is tell you that because the airline industry has a couple of things that um, they're trying to do, uh, and one is they're trying to make decisions about the dual function of the job, and two, the airline industry has uh, access to a lot of data. So as a result, they were very early adopters in taking OR and applying it in the context of aviation. Uh, and some of the, you can find papers published in the 1950s, for example, on how to take your fleet of aircraft and assign it to the flight schedule. All right, so 
Let me tell you about the impact first. So this guy, Tom Cook, was um, head of American Airlines Decision Te Technologies, which was the biggest group of uh, OR professionals in the world, and the earliest such group, I guess, um, applying OR to aviation. And what he said was that, for example, the, the tools, the OR tools to help make schedule planning uh, decisions generated 500 million in incremental profits annually, and without that, those tools and the revenue management tools, American Airlines would have been profitable only one year in the 1990s. So the airlines are very low margin, highly volatile in terms of their uh, profitability, and they have used operations research to provide some economic stability. So I thought I'd try to give you a little bit more flavor of how they do that. Um, so I thought I'd focus on the airline scheduling problem. Airline scheduling problem has a bunch of decisions. And they tend to think about them uh, sequentially, or they used to anyway. The first is to figure out uh, their schedule. Where should they fly and when? So that when you want to fly, you can go into the um, the system and book flights. Their second decision is how much capacity should I provide on these different flights? So that's a decision of how to plane, what type of seats you uh, um, assign to the flight. The next decision is once you decide what, how much capacity you're putting on each leg, now you have to take individual aircraft and sort of assign them to sequential legs and make sure that the, the, the aircraft visit maintenance stations at regular intervals. Um, you have to satisfy maintenance, maintenance check requirements. Once you do that, you've made a lot of decisions about what flight schedule you're offering, what aircraft will be flying them, and then you decide how do you assign the crews, the pilots, the flight attendants. We tend to worry mostly in these models about the crew that involves the, the uh, cockpit space. Okay. All right, no questions yet? Okay. All right, so, so this is where you can tell me if you, I totally lose you or if you get a sense of it. So I thought I would pick the crew scheduling problem. Um, it's often technically referred to as crew pairing problem. And what you try to do with that problem is, you have a set of flights that will be flown by, let's say, that have been assigned Boeing 737s, and now you have to take pilots who are qualified to fly that kind of plane and make sure that every flight has a set of qualified crews, pilot crews. And the idea is that you want to minimize the cost of that assignment. And the costs are nonlinear and pretty complex, driven by different um, bargaining agreements. And so they're a function of how much flying time you do, how much time you're working, and some minimum guarantee of how much you'll be paid if you're actually called out to do work. So, that's what we need to do. But in assigning crews to each flight, there are a bunch of restrictions, or in OR, constraints that we think about, that say things like this. Um, every, after you spend your time working, which can't be more than a certain number of hours, um, you have to have a certain amount of rest time. And when you're working, the amount of time you work is limited by X, and the amount of flying time is limited by something else. So the rules get really kind of tricky. There are restrictions like, I can't have you fly a sequence of flights, spend the night in Boston, go to San Francisco, do the same, and keep doing that before you get home. You, there's a certain amount of time that you can be away from home. And there's a long list. So if you go to write down those kinds of constraints mathematically, it gets tricky. 
and really hard, and in some ways, uh, impossible. Some of the constraints are really weird. Like you can't, in any 24 hour period, you can't fly more than a certain number of hours. So, um, so what we do is we create a, a different rep mathematical representation that captures all these complex constraints in a process that precedes the building of the mathematical model. Okay, so I'll give you an example that has eight flights, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Those are eight flights. And let's say that you take those eight flights and you say, what are the feasible crew schedules satisfying all those rules that I can build, and what are the costs? And so I, this very simple example I made up here, are the, the four different crew schedules that you could build and the associated costs. And by the way, I'm denoting each one of those feasible schedules with this decision variable Y. And so Y1 for the first crew schedule, Y2 for the second, et cetera. And then if you think about it, the rules where you take these feasible crew schedules and you have to pick the ones so that every flight has a crew assigned to it. And so what I list here is, there are two different solutions here. One is to pick the first cruise schedule and pick the fourth cruise schedule. And you'll see every flight has a crew assigned. And if you add up the cost, its cost is seven. And the only other solution that covers every flight, you know, assigns to every flight um, pilots, is uh, by putting the second crew schedule together with the third. And that cost is $6. So the way we would solve this problem is we would write down a set of constraints. Uh, you notice that there's a, a decision variable. So Y1 is, is going to be zero or one. Um, if Y1 is zero, then we're not gonna have that first schedule in our solution. If it's one, then it's gonna be picked in our solution. And the same for Y2, Y3, and Y4. And then we have these constraints that say, well, I know that flight A has to be assigned, these are called cover constraints, has to be assigned to some crew schedule. And the only ones that have flight A are one and two. So the sum of Y1 plus Y2 has to equal one. I mean, pick one of those schedules and not one of more than one. So we write that down for every play. And then we add an objective function, which is um, if we pick Y1, the cost will be one. If we pick Y2, it'll be two. Otherwise, the cost is zero. And we want to minimize that cost. So that's how we write down the problem. And so in general, when we're thinking about these problems, we're able to translate them into something that looks like this. So this is a um, this is a binary integer programming problem. Yes. Do you ever, or do the airlines ever, are they ever in a situation where they allow, let's say, the pilot's preference? So maybe somebody's willing to be away three days, and somebody's only willing to be away two days, and yes. therefore the whole everything is dependent somewhat on, on that. Yeah. So we, I'm simplifying this. Um, and first I'll say what we do in the US and what's done in the rest of the world is quite different with respect to preferences. Um, in many parts of the world, it's very much driven by preferences of the pilots. What we do is a little bit of a hybrid, so we come up with these schedules, which we call pairings, actually. And then we say, okay, this gives us like work that a, a crew will do for one day, two days, maybe three days. And so we get a bunch of those, and then we solve a second problem, which puts those together and says, well, for the first three days of the month, you're doing this, then you're off. Then there's another one for the next two days, and then you're off. And it puts all the different ways you can put a month schedule together. And then it lets pilots bid on them based on their seniority. So that's how they get their monthly schedule. Um, 
So this seems pretty simple, right? Um, I, I can write down this set partitioning problem pretty easily. But there are some challenges. Um, this is a you know, eight flight problem. And in general, if you look at a US airline, especially one with the hub and spoke network, the numbers of possible pairings or schedules measures in the billions, trillions, more. It's not, what did we have there for? Um, and this is just some examples. One of my students years ago said, I'm gonna actually count how many feasible. And they got to 250 flights and then they increased it to 500 because airlines might have a few thousand. Um, they increased it to 500 and they came back like three days later and said the model was still running and counting. So they gave up. Um, but the idea is there are lots of them. Okay, so that means that, that we have a challenge. Um, we overcame the challenge of how to write this down mathematically by coming up with this model that has the drawback that the number of decision variables can be, is exponential. Okay. So the big thing we always then have to face is tractability. Like how do we actually get this to be solvable? Okay, so even with the advances I talked about in the first slide, um, we can't solve problems of that size exactly. So what did we do? We and a bunch of people in the, um, in the field have for a long time been working on, and some long ones ago, but it, um, have worked on algorithms called branch and parts algorithms. Okay, so this is where it's a, definitely a leap of faith, and you can tell me whether or not you get the idea of how this works. Um, and if you, if you don't, then um, I'll try a different approach. Um, okay, so you know how, <laughs> this is kind of difficult. So remember how we wrote down that constraint matrix where the, every flight has to be assigned and there are zero, one variables? That, this is supposed to represent it, okay? So what it's saying is there's a bunch, there, every one of the columns in here is a, ver is a decision variable and there, and there are a bunch of constraints. So for the airline, real airline problems, these could be thousands, tens of thousands of constraints even, um, but certainly low thousands, and millions or billions or more of decision variables. So we cannot fit that whole thing and have it actually solve into our, our algorithms. So what do we do? The concept is this. Well, how about if we just ignore a whole bunch of the variables? Um, Let's start off by considering some of the variables. Let's get a solution when you only consider certain uh, options. We learn something from that solution and that points us to other solutions that we had ignored that we ought to consider and we add them in. We keep doing that for a while and then we get to a step where we say, okay, I've ignored a whole bunch of them, 90% of them, 95% of all the variables, I've ignored them. But because of this beautiful mathematical um, theory called duality theory, theory, we actually know that there is no variable that we have ignored that could improve our solution, which is really amazing, right? But the most amazing part of it is we know that and we don't even know what those variables are. We don't have to enumerate them. So I can tell you, so it's more like, I mean, in some ways it sounds magical, but it actually is mathematically true that the algorithm allows you to say, I have found the optimal set, I have found a set of decision variables within which I can find the best solution. Even though I'm ignoring nine million of my decision variables and I don't even know what they look like, I know they can't improve the solution. Amazing. And I um, am not going into the details of that, 
but you have a question. <laughs> uh oh. Um, so I guess the variables that you you do keep in your model mm -hmm. are those kind of these really abstract coupled variables that don't represent something intrinsically, or, or is it like this represents a certain flight and that's it, and I leave the rest out? Yeah. So the the ones I include would be like. Like if it would be if you do the analogy to what we were talking about over here. So let's say that four is too many. <laughs> um, I might start off and say, well, why don't I put one in three in? Oh, no, that's not feasible. One in four in, right? Let's just put those two in. Um, so it, you start off by taking just some subset of the, of the schedules. Um, and you can do something smarter than others to come up with how you begin that. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. The, the theory will, will still work. Um, and it will help you identify things you're ignoring that could help you, maybe help you. Um, and it will tell you when there's nothing out there that can help you. So is that fair, Vikram, that description? OK, any other questions out there? So anyway, this approach is hugely important to the advancement of um, aviation decision making. Because what it did was it allowed us to take these models that we figured out how to write down that have huge, huge numbers of decision variables. And it allowed us to apply an algorithm that considered only a small subset of them, which me meant that we could solve those, those small, smaller problems with the algorithms and the computers we had. OK, so, um, so what did that do? That launched more research, right? So at first, what it did was it said, we can move from solving the cruise scheduling problem using heuristics, rules of thumb, to solving it to, you can, you can prove how close you are to optimal. So you could push it to as close to optimality as you like, depending on how much co computation time you had. And so that was very powerful because as I pointed out before, airlines are a low profit margin industry. And so being able to, sh to do this more exactly and shave the cost is very important. Um, the second thing it did, more importantly, in the end, I think, is it allowed us to, to think a little bit more broadly about what it is we're actually doing. So, you know, there is this whole sequence of decisions up there. And you can imagine that when you make a decision about the flight schedule before you decide anything about the cruise, you are, by definition, restricting the options for your crews to something that's probably going to be more costly than if you integrated those decisions and made them at the same time. So these approaches, branch and price, allowed us to begin to think about how do we integrate various decisions together in that process. So that launched a, you know, another decade or more of papers where people were looking at how do you put these decisions together decisions together, how do you, you know, you, it, we are always like pushing the envelope of what could be solved. So what do you need to do in your model and in your algorithm to get to solve those integrated problems? Okay, so, oh, sorry. Um, <coughs> that's what that says. Okay, so that was phase one. Phase one, in my mind, and by the way, this is my definition. So. You know, you're not going to read it in history anywhere. But phase one in my mind of um, airline optimization was mostly about algorithms. How do you solve these problems? Uh, uh, you know, problems of the size airlines out there in the industry are facing. And phase two, I would characterize as modeling. So the mathematical modeling of the problems. And in particular, increasing a degree of realism in the mathematical models 
you know, one thing that is for certain, these very simplified models that we were solving, you would come up with a plan for what the crews would do to minimize costs, right? But guess what? Those crews actually never flew those plans because you probably have experienced this. Flights are delayed, flights are canceled, things happen. And so as a result, we're optimizing something, but it's never actually realizing the benefits of that because we haven't accounted for all the stochasticity and uncertainty and other elements um, in the real system. Another thing is we, we really oversimplified certain elements of this in the earlier models. So for example, we were coming up with what's the best airline schedule to offer you, the flying public, so that we maximize our, our profits. Well, what did we not include in those models? We didn't include what our competitors are doing <laughs> and what impact the competition would have on how, how we can sell seats in our network. So that is work that um, Vikran has, has done through his um, PhD research and beyond. And another element that we didn't include that's very important is the fact that passengers have a choice. So as we were modeling the revenue that we would capture from our decisions, we were saying, well, we're just gonna have the passengers do what we want them to do so that we maximize uh, revenue. Obviously, again, a huge assumption. And so in this phase two, and I, this is still where we, we the, the research community, where we still are, and that is how do we incorporate things like passengers have a choice and there's competition. And so what do the models look like then and how do you solve them? So we were trying to, I think, address a broader set of goals and challenges in the aviation system also. So I've been talking so far about airlines and focusing on how do we, how do we help airlines make better decisions. Um, but in fact, airlines operate within the aviation system and there are lots of challenges there. So for example, there's tremendous congestion and delays in our aviation system. And what some of the work that, that we've been doing or have done in the past is to change the focus from airlines and their profitability to what about the passenger experience? And what could airlines be doing in the aviation system what different operating strategies could they have so that passengers have less delay and a better experience? How do we think about the capacity in the US aviation system, which is limited in parts, and using it more effectively? And then also, how do we increase reliability, which by the way translates to increased profitability, for the airlines themselves? So I thought I would give you a few examples um, of, of those things. Okay, oh, one last thing, which I think is important. Another thing that I think has shifted in this second phase is that we think much more about how can we use these data and models and algorithms to inform aviation policy. Just, it's, there are lots of really interesting questions there. Okay, so let me just begin quickly by saying, a while ago, we did an in-depth study of airline delays and said back like a decade ago that the cost of airline de delays to the US economies was $31 billion, and about half of those costs are borne by the passengers. All right, so we know lots of delays in the system. So the question is, what opportunities do we have to try to reduce those delays? So first, a uh, real quick example that's just meant to be something really simple. So as airlines think about how they assign aircraft to their flights, they build a model and 
the model just says make sure that you satisfy maintenance requirements and every flight has a plane. So if, if this is a flight coming into um, Manchester, F1, then it might sit on the ground, the plane that is, and then it flies out on flight F3. And then there might be another plane coming in on flight F2, it sits on the ground and then flies out on F4. But what is true is that first in, first out doesn't make perfect sense here because there are some flights. For example, if F1 is coming from San Francisco or LaGuardia or Chicago, you're pretty sure that flight is going to be delayed. You just, <laughs> historically, that's what you're going to see. Okay? Um, and so that, what that means is that the plane finally arrives, and there's this min turn time to get people off the plane, get people back on the plane, fuel, bags, etc. And so what that means is you can't depart flight F3 until there's um, this minimum turn time. So delay propagates through the system. By the way, delay propagates through this network, because it's a network. And so when, when the next time the, they tell you your flight is delayed due to weather, and you look out the window and say, but the weather's great here, the point is there's bad weather somewhere. <laughs> and the plane is probably coming from there. So, so anyway, that, that, that's a problem. That means what we did without thinking about this is we've created a situation where almost always you're going to have a delay to that flight. And so what we know is that nearly one third of all delay in this aviation system in the US results from this propagation of delay. So why don't we think about that when we assign aircraft to these flights? It required a simple change in the objective function to minimize the expected propagation of delay. And um, so as a result, what we did was you end up with a solution that looks something like this. So it's putting flack in your system where you need it rather than not paying attention to that, okay? And so these are just some statistics, but basically what they're saying is, by doing this, we, cre we, we created new aircraft routings, and then we simulated it through what actually happened on days in the aviation system to see how does propagated delay change. And what we found was the airline that was doing this, their rank went from third as being most on time airline for that period to first. And they reduce the number of passengers who miss connections and then are delayed over extensive periods, periods by 10%. Okay, here's another thing that not everybody knows, and maybe I shouldn't share with you because you'll really wonder about us, but I will. So, yes? Yeah, so in this case, I'm not looking at overbooking because I'm looking at what the passengers who actually flew and kind of try to simulate what happens to them um, in this case as opposed to what actually happened. But yeah. Um, okay, so here's another thing that happens. So <laughs> in at most all of our US airports, except for like four or five of them, we allow airlines to schedule as many flights as they want, okay? We don't limit the number of scheduled flights to the capacity. So what that means is that we look like this over here. So the gray band, that's the range of capacity at, at the airport. Um, and this is JFK. And if you look at how many flights are scheduled to come in and out, across the hours of the day, you see that the scheduled number of flights exceeds capacity for a big part of the day, and sometimes in a big way. Now, the, we don't actually allow operations to happen in that way, because we do operate a safe system, which means that wherever you have a peak, those flights get pushed back, because they have to wait their turn, which means that every flight after gets pushed back. And so you have this huge propagation of delay. 
Now, contrast that with Europe. And on the left here is Frankfurt. And what you see is the capacity and that they have ensured that the number of flights that they schedule is below capacity. Now, just to be fair so we don't look like total idiots, I suppose, um, I'll say that there is one advantage to doing what we do, and that is that, you know, capacity in our aviation system is um, really scarce. And what happens when you plan to never have more capacity, use more capacity than there is, like in the Europe, European system, you end up, when you operate, often having excess capacity. So you're, you're kind of wasting capacity. In our system, we waste much less capacity, but the result is we have, um, can have highly variable um, experiences with respect to delays. Okay. So um, just so I can speed it up, let me tell you that there's one more challenge with respect to capacity. And that is, it's a, you see here, it's a gray band. We don't actually know the capacity at airports, um, not a priori anyway, because the capacity depends on the weather conditions. So if it's foggy in San Francisco, then the capacity will be reduced by about half. You have to shut down certain runways when it's windy. You can't have parallel runways. Separation between planes when you can't see anything out the window has to be greater than when you can, things like that. So the capacity complicates it. We don't actually know ahead of time when we're planning what the, what, how much capacity we'll have. But I'll give you just this one example of what you can do. So a colleague of mine, Amadeo Doni, and one of his former students, uh, Nicholas Pirashiotis, they said, okay, let's take a look at um, Newark. And here is what the Newark schedule looks like. And why don't we build a mathematical model and say, we'll allow flights to be moved like 30 minutes earlier or 30 minutes later. So this is in the scheduling stage. It's not day of, right? Let's plan our schedules so that we can move them slightly. And let's see if we can kind of top off those peaks, fill in the valleys. Um, and what they found was that they were able to change the schedule by not changing any flight more than 30 minutes. Um, and they were able, through their simulation process, to show that delays at Newark could be reduced by this change from 20 to 50 percent. So that's the kind of thing that I think is very cool that you can do with these um, OR models. But here's another idea. Never got this one off the ground, um, but I think it's a cool idea. So we keep talking about it. So how does the issue? to do is there are two hubs at 71 and 48. And it's showing the color, the, the lines are frequency. Each, there's a line depicting when there's a flight from the hub to this other location. So those are, those are the flights from the hubs, uh, sorry, from the hubs to the spokes. And then the colors, um, as they get hotter, um, go from small planes, the green ones, the light green ones, to big planes. And what you see here is there's a lot of green in there. There's a lot of brown. So here are these hub operations where the capacity in, on the runways in these hubs is really limited. And what we are doing is we're using the capacity for these planes with 50 seats. And guess what? When you land a plane with 50 seats and it uses the runway, it uses the same amount of runway, maybe even more time on the runway, than a big plane that has a couple hundred seats. So we have, we're not incentivizing our airlines in a way that has them using the airport capacity, the landing 
the runway capacity efficiently. What they're doing instead is they're competing. And they're saying, well, United has 30 flights a day between New York and Boston, so I, American, have to have 30 flights a day. And, and if you look at certain markets, you see this crazy number of flights. But to have 30 flights a day, you can't fly a big plane, fly a little plane, because you don't have many people who, um, for each one of those flights. So the idea here is to, okay, let's try to incentivize the airline so that the objectives of using landing capacity efficiently is aligned with the airline's objectives. So how about auctioning off landing slots? And so this, this is, we did this, built this simulator, worked with airlines, and what we did was we said, okay, here's where we're starting, this is what you guys do right now, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start an auction, and then you're gonna tell us for these prices how you're gonna change your schedule at these locations because at some point it's not worth it for you to pay to have to um, land in 48. That's where the, we're auctioning things off. Okay, so think of it as a New York airport. And so after, um, this is round zero, and after round five where we had small increases in prices, what we saw was that they started to upgauge, which means they started changing the flights from smaller planes to bigger planes at that airport 48 that were making them pay to land. And we're not making them, that's the other thing. We charge by the weight of the plane right now when they land. That's exactly the wrong way to charge because we're disincentivizing them. But the charge is small enough, it doesn't matter. Just is to point out that our alignment of policies and what we want opera operationally, not well thought out. Okay? So, so we are having bigger planes, more red at 48, and they're cutting, because now they're flying bigger planes, they don't have to fly so many flights, so they're reducing frequency. And then, if you go to the last round, you see that how it's really different now. In this place that's highly constrained, only a big plane, lower frequency, and they built a new hub at a different place that has capacity. And so the idea is, can you, um, by, in, by pricing landing capacity appropriately, get airlines to, be, to change their schedules that will reduce overall congestion and delays in the system? Okay, so I just want to do one more example. And this is a similar experiment, only instead of auctioning, we said, well, what if you just actually said, hey, airlines, you can't schedule more flights. What we did was we looked at LaGuardia, and we said, let's reduce the number of flights by 12.3%, because what that did was it reduced the number of flights that were in there now to the capacity when there are, there's good weather conditions. So we wanted to know, all right, let's, uh, sorry, bad weather conditions. So if there's bad weather, we won't be exceeding the capacity. So what happened when we did that? And by the way, we built a bunch of models, the Crompton was very involved in this, um, that showed we used game theory to model the competition between the airlines how they would change their schedules as you reduce the number of flights they could fly into LaGuardia. And then we modeled who they would capture in terms of passengers to understand the impact on profitability. And then we modeled the system to understand how delays would change, okay? So what happened is by reducing the number of flights into LaGuardia, there was a flight delay system-wide 40%. This shows you delays propagate. So helping to fix LaGuardia helped to have a 40% reduction in the national system. Operating profits went up by about 20%, which is pointing out that in the system where you didn't have caps, although an airline, if they could reduce their number of flights into it and everybody else did the same, they could be more profitable. If you are the only airline doing that, 
you reduce your number of flights and someone else decides to increase their flights, you have the same delays and you have less profit. So it has to be something that is imposed on the system um, and doesn't work for a single airline. And then um, it, th that's just a point that different airlines were affected differently by profitability. And then um, I'll just conclude that what this shows us is that we could delay flights to passengers. Um, we could reduce delays to flights and passengers, improve profit of the airlines, and we didn't decrease the frequency and options of travel for passengers. And then I'll just summarize with, um, with the following. Uh, so I think that the, the important role and contributions of OR to aviation are that we've been increasingly developing models, models that are increasingly realistic. Um, we are taking these powerful algorithms that are capable of taking these real, real applications and uh, being able to solve them. We have done, made several fundamental OR advances that apply in general, not just to airlines, by integrating elements of game theory, discrete choice modeling, stochastic and robust optimization, et cetera. And as a result, we've improved utilization of resources and had tremendous financial impacts to the national aviation system and to airlines in the US. And I'll ask if there are any questions.